become a success. I have become more and more interested, as I'm sure some of you are, on um, what are the characteristics that it takes to be successful in the business world. Well, I thought I'd just start with some proof of one of my personality disorders. I have two. I am both bold and colourful. And this is the evidence of my uh, boldness, showing off some of the books I've written. <laughs> there are some of my clients. Uh, you get an extra glass of sherry in the evening if you know who this is. You know who that is? The royal household. The royal household. I do work at Buckingham Palace. That is the Queen, who has a big HR department. You probably don't know much about. And I do training there. Okay, this is just me showing off. Let's, uh, let's go to the question. What does it take to be successful in business? What is it you need? What characteristics are the characteristics that you need? Do you need to be bright? If so, how bright? Do you just need to be bright enough? Is there, is there a linear correlation between intelligence and success in business? And if so, which business? What about our old friend prudence, conscientiousness? What about that? To what extent does that play a role? We know that it predicts longevity. Of all the personality variables that you want to measure, there are two that do all the work for you. And they are <coughs> neuroticism or adjustment and conscientiousness prudence. They have suck up most of the variables or most of the variables. And there is emotional intelligence. What about extroversion? Does it pay to be an extrovert? Most, most leaders, most successful people in business appear to be extroverted. Or are they fading? Are they what Isaac used to call a socialized extrovert? They're introverts. Faking it, because you have to fake it, because business is, leadership is a contact sport, and the requirement is that you at least look extrovert. What about uh, our old friend office of control? Is it that fact that you have to have um, instrumentalism, uh, self-efficacy, or whatever? To what extent does that play a role? And what about old boy contacts? This is a very good place for a bit of old boy contacts. I'm wearing my old boy tie. I'm sure somebody who just flashing the cufflinks, you can make, make sure I went to a proper school and a proper university. Or is it just sheer luck? Is it right place, right time, uh, face fits? What accounts for uh, success? I, I'm doing a little um, um, presentation, in fact, Bob will be there in, in Norway uh, in November and December. And I'm doing some work on bio data at the moment and the biography of people of success. And what's, Fascinating is the number of world prime ministers who come from Oxford and a few from that other university. And uh, how many world leaders come from London School of Economics? And the extent to which certain biographical backgrounds predict success in life. Okay, well, does it depend, when we're talking about predictors of things, does it depend on what aspect of work you're looking at? Are some variables, some factors, do they predict job proficiency and productivity? which are different from sales success. I just recently finished a, a paper using uh, all of the open measures and showed how the profile, of course, of a successful salesperson is enormously different from the profile of people in other parts of a general manager. And when you meet salespeople, of course, we know one of the things we know with salespeople is yet one of the few jobs where the correlation between intelligence and success is nil. You don't need to be bright to be in sales, you need to be resilient and the profile of successful salespeople is very different from the success of others. And so therefore, is that, uh, would you have to look at very different factors to take that into consideration? What about CWBs? I'm particularly interested in CWBs, counter work behaviors. I'm interested in people who lie and steal and cheat and in fraud. How many American CEOs are there in prison at the moment? Bob alerted to me just some years ago. Is it still 35, Bob? I can't remember. How many CEOs? Are a large number of CEOs in prison through fraud <coughs> and other like activities is, are, do, is, a, is a different set of personality variables. Do they predict that? <coughs> what about uh, job satisfaction? You know, we, we gave up talking about job satisfaction some years ago because it's shown to be surprisingly heritable. That is, that there are people, and I'm sure you know, who go from job to job pissed off and gloom mongers. They are, in many ways, as one might call, heart sinking patients. And well, I have them in my students periodically. And they are carriers of dissatisfaction wherever they are. And can you predict job satisfaction personality? What about leadership? 
And the one I want to talk about in my last study, which is probably the best one I'm going to talk about, is that promotion speed. In other words, the dependent variable is how fast you get up the greasy pole. And there are some organizations which measure this very well and very carefully. You can see, for instance, I teach military people, I teach one-star generals. And what you notice there is, surprisingly, you might find them a uh, one-star general aged 43, 44, which is very impressive indeed. And so is it the speed, what predicts the speed of getting up uh, the greasy land? So those are the sort of things I, I want to talk about. I've just come back from a trip around Asia, where I was in four Asian countries and uh, five Asian countries. Uh, no, four Asian countries in five days. That's how difficult it all is. And one of the things I was talking to them about was a topic I had become more and more interested in, and that is office politics. The Americans have very wisely rebranded office politics as office savvy. And the question is, how do you become savvy as opposed to how do you become political? Because if you talk about office politics, some people say you know, you'll never get on in this organization if you're bright and hardworking and dedicated and clean and honest and have integrity. You have a chance in this organization because it's also damn political. So I want to say a few words about office politics and the extent to which one might attribute success by office politics. So is this office politics? Is it backstabbing, brown nosing, and boot looking, and old boy networks? Is it basically a pretty dirty thing? And people believe, <coughs> say, if I say to people, I was with the organization, you know, put up your hands if you think your organization is very political. Nearly always every hand goes up. And what they mean by office politics is this sort of stuff. It's dirty, it's nasty, it's manipulative, it's Machiavellian, it's power play. And that if you are simply hardworking and talented, you haven't got a chance until you become devious like the rest of the clients. Well, it's not the only interpretation. Um, why are some organizations more political than others? Um, why are some people so bitchy? You know, academics are supposed to be the most bitchy people in the world, uh, mainly because I think they're so badly paid. But it's a very bitchy sort of world. And is it different from working in British Airways or BP or whatever? What are the characteristics of organizations that lead them to be more political rather than less political? And those are some ideas that people have come up with. Well, there are, of course, two views of politics. And you can, everyone can do one of these two slides where you have the sort of negative side. So you can describe it as you know, she is incredibly manipulative as opposed to she is very influential. They, they are such a political team, we're just trying to get our job done. And so what you can do, and people will do this in organizations, they will put a positive spin on a negative activity. So you could say, you know, I, uh, I, grapevine is rife. And I've just written an article for the latest psychology today, if you read that blog, about gossip is good for you, and how useful the grapevine is, and how uh, important that might be. So, there's two views of this. And what I think a man called De Luca has written a rather good book on this, which has informed some of my thinking. And that's he talks about office savvy. There are now about six books called office savvy. And the question is, what is office savvy? Does office savvy account for success in business? And to what extent, if it's true, can you learn some of these skills? And so, on the one hand, you could say people were Machiavellian. On the other hand, you could say, no, they had office savvy. And some of you will recognize that slide, which is a typological slide, where you have people who are politically aware versus people who are not politically aware, and those who, quote, play games, i.e. are manipulative, Machiavellian, low integrity, and those who act with integrity. And what's fun is for you to classify yourself. In other words, you say, well, you know, on this on these dimensions, where are you on this dimension? How, how much political awareness do you have? Are you smart politically, or are you not? by your own definition. And to what extent do you think you act with integrity, or you know, are you capable of or enjoy playing games? Well, of course, most people won't want to put themselves in that criteria. But you can see over here, I remember going on a course a number of years ago and classifying myself as an innocent, as a sheep. And the implication would be from this literature is that you don't, by and large, become very successful in business unless you are politically aware. Have political savvy. And so there are many of these 
two by twos, which I'm sure you've seen. <coughs> That's by the way how you become a consultant is just be able to do a two by two. Well, there is this is a, a quite interesting sphere of influence on uh, political awareness or political savvy or whatever, and I've been looking into this, and I think it's this is a, a reasonably sensitive model, and it starts off with the leader's political skill. Uh, you can call it political savvy, political awareness, political skill. But how politically astute are you? I have a boss. He's the most famous living psychoanalyst. He's a Freudian. And this man is, oh, it's being filled, isn't it? Um, he is very, very politically astute. And I'm enormously pleased that I report to him and that I'm in his group. Because his political astuteness, his political sophistication, makes me and the group I'm in much, much more successful as a function of his skill. And so when you see people operating politically with integrity, with being in, in the previous model A and alpha, you see the huge advantage of being that. But if you get in his slipstream, which I am in, I think I can become considerably more successful. So this model says the skill of the political leader, and we can ask the question to what extent personality variables predict that skill, leads to the, the subordinate perception of organizational support. So if my boss, as I indeed do, and I'll tell you why in a minute, I feel supported by this man, this political system. This leads to, because he's good, it leads to trust and it leads to satisfaction, it leads to non-cynicism because he's very good. And that in turn leads to my commitment. So this model says political skill leads me to who I, because my boss is political skill, I therefore feel supported and I have a lot of trust, no sense, less cynicism. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting model. There's lots of ideas about this, uh, which I probably haven't got time to go into. But let me more work, work forward, because I want to talk about the studies I've done. And this is about, well, what is this thing called political savvy? What, how do you break it down? How do you unpick it? What are its component parts? Well, according to a couple of the best workers, a man called Bickel, who's a German psychologist of some distinction, he has a little test, a little model of this. And he said there are three, sorry, four components. They're all intercorrelated, but they are independently predictive of this thing called political skill. And the first is social astuteness. Uh, there are lots of words for social astuteness. Perceptive, insightful, vagaries, nuances. And you could call it emotional intelligence. And I just see there is a, uh, so I think it's relatively new, Hogan's emotional intelligence uh, test. Uh, what is emotional intelligence? Well, it's about being aware of your emotions and about being aware of other people's emotions. It's about being able to manage those emotions, managing both your own and other people's emotions. But it's also about astuteness, picking up the cues. This colleague of mine, my boss, has amazing, I think it's probably due to his psychoanalytic training, but I remember being in a room with him and he picks up stuff I don't pick up. He said, this man doesn't like you. Did you know that? He doesn't like you. I said, oh, really? I don't pick that up. And he picks it up. He's got this third eye, sometimes called psychological mindedness. He has it. Now, can you acquire it? Yes, you can learn some of these stuff, these things. You can learn to become more perceptive, more socially astute, more emotionally intelligent. It is a skill. You might not go from here to here, but you might move slightly on that, on that back. And of course, the, set, the politically skilled individual picks the stuff up, notices subtleties, notices when yes means no, notices when they disagree, etc., etc. <coughs> I was expect, explaining to some of my foreign students, you might have seen this article in the paper recently about how, how to decode the British. And when the British say to you, if you say so, it means you're a complete fool and I disagree with you entirely. Or, if, you know, uh, what's the other thing they say? With all respect. And if you say that, you're about to insult people. I have this little course for foreign students teaching them about uh, the British. But a social student is visual and verbal and vocal uh, ability to pick up the cues. Next, there is interpersonal influence. And I was talking about the work of Cialdini. I think Cialdini's book on influence is wonderful. You know he has these six influence principles, reciprocity, uh, uh, scarcity, etc., etc., and you can see this if you go into organisations how they use this. You can teach people 
you can teach people the skill of interpersonal influence. You only have to go, and go to a shop and see where they're trying to purchase things. You see how they are putting into practice. I was going to buy a motor car last year. I, I have a bicycle. My wife has the car. And we went to buy a motor car. And I said to this man he, in the showroom, I, I explained to him the five principles, or five of the six principles he was using in this particular issue. It was absolutely fascinating. For instance, he went to him and said, what was the first question? What do you think the first question was? I was asked in the car sales room. Sir, he said, if the price were right, would you buy today? I said, yes, that's commitment and consistency. That's the second principle from Chaldean. Then he said, sir, he said, is the safety of your family the most important thing for you? To which you can say, no, don't mind if they were dying. I said, yes. Yeah. And then, then we went on the next one. He said, Look, come and have a coffee with me, sir. Come to the table to talk to I said, yes, that's called reciprocity. That's the second principle, etc., etc. You can teach people the principles, the fundamental principles of social influence. And this is the third, second factor. The third factor is what my wife calls networming. Uh, it's terribly <laughs> old. She says there's only one letter difference between networking and not working. But of course, one of the things you notice if you go to organizations, and it's part of the, you know, part of the great benefits of a conference like this, is to meet people. It's to meet people and to work out the power map. One of the things I do, I've got an interesting case study that's taken from this book. And the question is, how do you get to people? Rolls-Royce have only seven Rolls-Royce engines, that is, have only seven salespeople. But their job is to target the person of an airline that doesn't have Rolls-Royce engines and sell them Rolls-Royce engines. That means huge numbers, huge billions and billions. And one of the things they'll do is they'll map it. I was shown recently by a colleague a map of how to get to Angela Merkel. How do you get to, I don't know why you particularly want to get to Angela Merkel, but he did. And the question is, what's the power map? Who, who is networked? How is she networked? And who gets to her with one what sort of thing? Now, if you do this, if you plan and plot the network of the people who are influential in your promotion, one of the things you'll notice with sophisticated people is that ability to, to see the power map, to know who to contact, who has the power, and who influences the other people. And that is a function of this thing called <coughs> networking. The fourth characteristic is, I like this, it's called apparent sincerity. Uh, you might think that that is oxymoronic, but of course one of the things you have to do, I always like the concept of emotional labor, there's a woman who wrote a book about 20 years ago about, about emotional labor. And she said there's three types of labor. Physical labor, intellectual labor, and the third type is emotional labor. And of course it's about going on an aeroplane. Anyone who's in the service occupation does emotional labor. Now people say, oh, we've got to be authentic at work. Oh, nonsense. You can't expect the people out there to be authentic at work. They've got to be nice to you, whether they've got a hangover, whether their boyfriend's left them, whatever. Their job is to do apparent sincerity. Hello, sir. Not to see that, yes, sir. Well, of course, one of the tasks you have to do in leadership is to, one of the, to, to ask my ex-boss, wasn't very good at it, was pretending that everybody's work was equally important, which he didn't believe it was, and leaked it. And this was not good. It wasn't good at the parents and Sarah. Okay, so what's the story here? The story is, there's some interesting work on political skill, on political intelligence, on political savvy. And these are some of the components. Now, I think that some of these, of course, are other names for psychological variables we're familiar with. And furthermore, I think, indeed, that the, um, the, the literature um, would support uh, these factors being influential in predicting people's success in the workplace. Well, many of you will recognize this list. Um, it is, uh, these are words taken from uh, Dotlich and Kyra, who stole all of Bob's ideas and wrote a book called Why CEOs Fail. And I often ask people, and I say, you know, one of the great problems we have with selection is everybody selects in and nobody selects out. You know, as I do, um, that nutters are attracted to psychology. And for years at University College, our entire selection interview was a select out interview, not a select in interview. We, we assumed that they were bright enough because of 
we, we only interview uh, 100 people of the, no, 300 people of the 2,000 to apply. We've seen that right now in my work now. But what we're interested in is whether they're emotionally stable enough, because nutters are attracted to psychology. You probably notice that people who want to go into counseling usually need it. Well, this is the list of, of things that you need to select out. And these are the words used by Dr. Luke and Kyra and others for the dark side variables, the HDS, etc. And of course, the fascination of that, I got all these ideas from Bob, and he'll tell you that his own ideas much more clearly than I. But the interest is in the paradox. And the paradox that these dark side variables are actually hugely beneficial. If you have enough of these and you exploit them well, you can do very, very well in life. And there are this study after study, you have to read your local newspaper for seeing the number of CEOs who derail and fail, who have been enormously successful, who quite painfully have a number of these dark side variables. And as I've said to many people many times, if you are intelligent, articulate, good looking, and a narcissistic psychopath, bold and mischievous, go into the city of London and make lots of money. You will do terribly, terribly well and might not even be caught. So the question is, what, what do we have on this data? Now, again, this is a slide I stole from Bob, who read, reads more widely than I do. This is Karen Horney, a very famous American uh, German psychoanalyst. And she, I think, I always think of my, my friend Hans Eising when she talks about this. Hans Eising said, he said, there are you know, three personality variables extroversion, neuroticism, and psychotism. And, and he used these words very similarly. So, away from is neurotic, against is psychotic, and towards is external. And she said very clearly, and people like this, it's a very simple model, basically do people move towards, away from, or against people? It's a very simple model to think of. Well, of course, the psychiatrists have thought of this model. So if you look at the classification of DSM-4 and DSM-5, of the personality disorders, they come up with these three models, odd and eccentric, which is away, Dramatic emotion and erratic, and these are the dangerous buggers, which are against, and anxious and fearful, which is towards. And so these are classification, psychiatric classification, very similar to Hawley's classification, and very similar to Bob's classification. Well, these are the personality disorders that I think are the most liable to be relevant to success at work, success and failure in the workplace. So we all know about uh, psychopaths. Some of you must have read that rather good book called Snakes and Suits, when the psychopath goes to work. When people read this book, it does change them because they then begin to understand the success of their bosses. And these other characteristics, which I don't have time to go into. What I want to do is I want to show you some, um, some data, some studies. And my colleague, Tomas Chimoda from Music, is in the room, and some of these papers are published with him. This, these, this data was all taken from uh, a big consultancy company in this country who runs assessment centers and logs their data. And so we've been able to use uh, the data to investigate some of these issues. And there is a, a problem with this data. It's not longitudinal data. It's cross-sectional data. So we have the rank, and we have, in the last study, I think the better one, and how long it takes for them to get to the top. But what they do is they run an assessment center, they've been doing this for nearly 20 years, and they run uh, intelligence tests and personality tests. They have wisely, after a period of time, in fact, after me trying to debug them, they have taken the HDS, which they say, as I'm sure you all know, to be one of the most useful of all tests for both selection and counseling. But they have other data as well. And what they have is large numbers of people who are managers, and senior managers, and also people who are non-managers. I, um, I was in Dubai, I was caught under the ash cloud. I don't know if any of you were caught under the ash cloud. Uh, Dubai is paradise if you like swimming and shopping. Not particularly interesting if you like anything else in my view. And I went to this lecture by um, Marcus Buckingham. Marcus Buckingham, you've heard of him? I know he's a guru. You know how I know he's a guru? He was charging $35,000 for this lecture. You could have bought the book for $12.99, but it was rather good. And he said rather, rather well, he's very engaging, he's young, he's attractive, he's uh, fun, not got hubris or indeed humility. He said there's only three types of jobs. 
technical jobs, supervisory jobs, strategic jobs. You are selected for your technical knowledge. An aeroplane pilot has technical knowledge. A brain surgeon has technical knowledge. But what do they do to you when you're successful? What, is the, what, do, what do HR do to you when you're a very good brain surgeon? Make you manage people. They promote you to not doing what you're good at. And they say, go and manage these people. Go and engage that team. And all of you in the room must have had the experience of a rather geeky, sort of near, near Asperger's, very successful you know, engineer or accountant or something, who is promoted into doing something he hates doing, doesn't understand doing, and you lose a good manager, uh, you lose a good engineer, and you gain a bad manager. I was, in, I was doing some work in a mine, I just story very really, a wonderful country of mine. I was there doing work for petroleum development in Iran, and I was called in, and boss called me and he said, I uh, need to have a word with you. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to be one of these my wife doesn't understand me questions, to which I usually reply, more than mine, so join the club. And he said, uh, we've got a problem with the chief drilling engineer. He said, um, can you give him, a, he hasn't got emotional intelligence, can you give it to him while he's here? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, do you have brain surgery or very powerful drugs available? Right? And I met him, he was a lovely man, he was a very charming man. He liked going into desert and drilling holes. That was what he was good at, it was what he liked doing, he found a and one day he was promoted to sitting in an office and doing, you know, you know timetables or something. And he wasn't any good at it. And he never would be any good at it. And the question is, and some of the data you'll see, and these are non-managers. And some people who have gone on assessments, these will all be people around 40, about that, so they'll be at that stage of their lives. Some of them will be senior managers, some will be managers, and some will be non-managers. And the non-managers are usually people who are specialists. And I think they're specialists for a reason. Okay. Well, here are some of the papers. <coughs> this is uh, this is Thomas. Uh, this is one. This has got now. I, I'm not always choosing these these questionnaires. This is the MBTI, which uh, people don't use very much anymore, um, for good reason. And it's, it's still one done every minute, as I'm sure you know. But what we've done here is we've got the correlation. This is the correlation between time in the Greasy Pole and various schools. And what you see there is, of course, it's related to gender and age. Yes, very sadly, you predict that. Uh, but you've got neuroticism, of course, <coughs> negatively correlated, always negatively correlated, because adjustment is the most powerful of all the variables. People who are prone to anxiety and depression and all the rest of it don't manage well. They can't, they, you know, can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen, and they don't like being in the kitchen when it's too hot. Extroversion, quite good, no doubt, the sociability of extroversion. And conscientiousness. Our friend. Remember, I said neuroticism and conscientiousness, prudence and adjustment, the two factors which suck up the variance. You're going to get a bit of stuff there with extroversion. Well, the, the, uh, the MBTI things work okay, but not as well as the proper measures. And here we have, looking at this at the uh, facet level using the, um, <coughs> using the near. And again, what you find is that you, you can make some easy scores to see achievement, striving down there, dutifulness. What I like in my students, you know, it's astonishing. Two, of, two students have knocked on my door in the last week. And they've, they've, met, they've said, I'm interested in your work. I, I like your work. What I'm volunteering to do is to become your unpaid research assistant for as long as you like. What do they have in common? They were both East Europeans. Achievement striving. Hard work. Very impressive. You need to be bright, but my God, if you've got a bit of this achievement striving, you can do well. So what does this say? Don't be neurotic. Do be conscientious, and you've got a better chance of climbing the greasy pole. <coughs> Conclusions, correlations, and small, but replicated previous research. Stable, conscientious extroverts do best in that order. And discriminative analysis shows that after age, the best discriminators were extroversion and conscientiousness. The extroversion is the comfortable, people oriented skills. Okay, next slide. This is one on intelligence, Watson Glazer, uh, and the fire, the good old fire. Anyone of you fire fanatics? Fire is such. So psychometrically, such a poor instrument. But my goodness, if you're a fire fan, as I used to be, it's that one dimension that makes all the difference, and that it's, it, it, it's um, a, a expressed control that sucks up everything for you and does all the good work. What this shows is, yeah, as you would expect, uh, this is about intelligence, and so the, uh, the, 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 the scores show here that the, the, the non-managers are the, the brightest, these are the technical people, followed by the managers, and the manager of managers were not necessarily that bright. 
the implication is that intelligence is not that useful for the one school. For the other, it was the other way around. This is the Watson <coughs> case, and that's another measure. Slightly different measures, slightly different sort of findings. There's my friend, wanted control and expressed control. As I said, I think the fire road, that is mysteriously important. It picks up these measures so very well. But I want to move on. And we had, and this is the early study, and the ends aren't very big. So here we have the HDS, and what it shows is that uh, the non-managers score, uh, score quite high on colourful, uh, but the manager and managers score high as well. I'm pleased to say that colourful is my major dark side, and that I take some comfort from this. It's not very good being diligent or dutiful. You never make it to the top. Okay, the conclusion for the significant difference is an IQ, specialists do particularly well on intelligence. You can see the manager more sociable, inclusive, extroverted, but also more interested in control. Wanted control and express control. That's the dimension that's exciting. Senior managers are more prone to histrionic and OCD, but less prone to dependent and uh, personality disorder. Uh, here's another one. Oh, let me move on because this is uh, too, too heavy. I want to talk about. Um, oh, it, it, uh, can I go back? Yes, I can. Can you just go back to the previous one? There. Yes. Uh, no, back, back. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is quite interesting. Um, I have been working a, a little bit on creativity. Creativity is a backwater in psychology. And it's a backwater because we can't. <coughs> I have a very interesting uh, girl from Luxembourg with me at the moment. And there are many tests of creativity, and none of them are particularly good. However, one of the very old ones, which is on um, divergent thinking, seems to do the job pretty well. You can see in a group, it takes two or three minutes to administer these tests, you can see a really interesting spread of scores. And it does fit rather nicely with. Um, with all sorts of other variables. Now, what this organization does, this consultancy, they have a consequences test. It was devised in 1953. So you give them three minutes or five minutes to write down what would happen if nobody had to eat again? What are the consequences of that? What would happen if everyone went blind? What are the consequences of that? And the, and the analysis is of the, of, is of, the, of the creativity of the questions, uh, uh, of, the, of the concepts you come up with. And it's quite a good test of consequences too. So here we have, um, creativity, and there we have males and females. And you can see very strongly there this interesting divergent thinking, this think outside the box of the senior managers. That's nicely linear, and a big difference with females. See the dramatic difference with females. This idea of convergent, divergent thinking of creativity. Okay, well. This study is, I think, the best of the ones I have. Unfortunately, numbers are very small, and it's entirely my own fault. It's just being published at the moment. And what we did, what we've got, is data on a large number of people. We have uh, 8,000, uh, uh, um, as you can see, nearly 8,000 people, males and females. And they're from a huge range of organizations, because they, this consultancy will run these assessment centers. And one of the things they've been asked, they've all been asked, is how long it took you to climb up the greasy ladder in your organization. So it's length of time to promotion to manager and then senior manager. Now you will have in your own terminology, in your own organization, some concept of this, what a manager and senior manager is. And they will trust you to say, well, that level you'll call manager and that level you'll call senior manager. So the question was for you, if you stayed in the organization for long enough, how long did it take for you to get to manager and then to senior manager? So this is based in time. And so small numbers are good, because small numbers mean you climb the greasy pole faster. That's the game. So they're in their late 30s or early 50s, employed by British organizations, the private sector and the public sector. We fiddled around with private and private and public and didn't show a huge amount of difference. Of them, 4,500 were promoted to manager and 3,000 to senior manager. So it's a nice big data set, it's across the country, it's nearly always middle class, middle aged, white people, but these are people who are, who are being very successful in organizations, and the data has been collected from 1995 to 2013. And so I know you can't see this very well here, but what we have is we have the big five, this is because they use the measure by uh, Craig. Here we have GMA, that is a rather good test, an intelligence test. And then we have the HDS down here. So uh, the dependent variable 
is years to manager and years to senior manager. And so what you want is a negative correlation is a good thing because you go faster. <coughs> and so what this says, and I'll show you the regression in a moment, is that extroverts get up the greasy pole faster. They get up the greasy pole faster, no, no doubt, because extroverts are more comfortable with others. We all know there are, of course, trade-offs with extroverts. Extroverts trade off uh, accuracy for speed. Extroverts are more likely to have accidents. Extroverts are more likely to, to, to say things they shouldn't say, etc. Et so there are some negative consequences, but extroversion works relatively well. Notice that openness is negative. So openness does well. People who are more imaginative. And there's our conscientious. So look, don't be neurotic. Do be extroverted. Openness helps and conscientiousness. Always the same. But let's go to the really interesting ones, because this is what I'm particularly interested in, and I'm sure you are in the room. Which of the HDS factors predict success, and which do not? So what we have here is we have uh, cautiousness, negative, not sorry, positive, meaning slow. Cautious and reserved. These people don't get on. Well, it's not a great surprise, is it? It's not a great surprise that these dark side variables hold you back. This cautious paranoia, this reserve, this whole back stuff is not good for you. What do we else do? We have uh, leisurely, passive aggressive, not very good either, not very nice people to spend a lot of time with. They don't get promoted as speedily as else. But what does get promoted? Bold, mysterious, and way, I'm so pleased about this, colourful, because that's my disorder, which you're probably able to notice immediately. So who gets on in life? The bold, the colourful, and the mysterious, which is what you would predict. Diligent, um, um, uh, dutiful, positive, but they're not that strong. And we control for social desirability. So what I did was, I put this into a regression and used the moving against, moving away from, and moving towards ideas. Now if you do a factor analysis of the HDS, it's very consistent and very clear. And these factors always come out very nice and clear. And it's exactly the same factors as the corny, it's the same factors as the psychoanalysis, moving against, moving towards, whatever. And so we're now saying, this is for, for manage, for, this is years to senior manage. So how long does it take, you come into an organization, how long does it take for you to get out that greasy pot? What things work for you? Well, of course age works for you. Inevitably, that's at that time. So that's an important variable. And GMA works for you. GMA is intelligence. And of course, the, the signs are negative because, as I said, negative means faster. So brighter people do well. We don't have any, the big five, only conscientious works for you. People who pitch up, prudence. People who pitch up, people who pitch in. People who are prepared to go that extra mile. Achievement motivation. Hunger. Good thing. That's why you have greasy pop. But look, look at the Dark side factors, both moving against, all three work, and they work rather well, and they account for a reasonable amount of the variance. So we're trying for 20% of the variance. So the moving against is good, mischievous, bold, narcissistic, etc. The, mo the moving away and the moving, to uh, and the moving uh, uh, towards, they too don't work. And here's the time to manage the same. So this is, that was time to see in managers. And this is time to manage. So the story is roughly the same. Age makes a big difference, of course, and intelligence, conscientiousness, and here we have the factors here moving against and moving towards. So, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is there are, and we can see, and I'm working on some studies where we've got longitudinal data. And of course, longitudinal data is much more sexy than cross sectional data because you can follow people through time. And longitudinal data is very difficult to get hold of and very expensive. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, you've got them at time here, what are the characteristics? And many of you are interested in selection, so you, you, you're getting young graduates. What is it about the graduates at time one predicts their success at time two, as measured by how fast they climb up the greasy pole? Bright, hardworking, creative people. That comes from my earlier studies. It's the, it's the bright intelligence is always a correlation, not strongly always. 
but it is there. Hardworking is conscientiousness and prudence. And creative, this openness to experience, this sense of the mind, this trying to think, of, think through problems. But the derailers, the HDS stuff, is sometimes the better predictors. As you would predict, darkness predicts light. It may be that if there is a god, the dark side might help you at the greasy pole, but in the most common cause, it helps you to slide back. So what's the moral of my tale? The moral of my tale is listening to Bob 10 years ago with him saying that you wouldn't expect this, would you? You wouldn't expect that what I might call the dark side, the derailers, the developmental issues, that if you have them up to a point, if you are, if you are self-aware about them and able to control them up to a point, they might facilitate enormously that climb up the greasy pole. Some of them are going to hold you back. Some of them will help you forward. In excess, those ones that, that of the one we were talking about may be mischievous and bold, the two ones which always should make your lit red light come on and the bulb curse. Those two were the ones which will predict best of all. But if in extremis will cause, I think, the person to go as very fast up the greasy pole, but slide down immediately thereafter. Thank you very much.